Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Journal Club. Today we are in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I'm very excited for the panel that we have because we're very lucky to have a team of pediatric surgeons, which is, which is very unique for us. We haven't ha covered this topic before. Now, with the exception of, of very few, at least according to my life, or wife, but m most children do grow up to be adults. And so uh, as adult surgeons, it is uh, invaluable to understand what happened before. And so I think hopefully this will give us a, a window into both the thought process of pediatric surgery, but also the manifestations of what happens when these patients grow up to be adults. And this is our team, of course, uh, Dr. Galandiak is the editor in chief. And so she always attends, so that's fantastic. And, and we thank her for her guidance. Uh, this is our disclaimer. Now, because we're going to talk a little bit more about the conditions, we're not going to have a poll this time, but I'm sure there's a lot of information for us. So as is my custom, a fun fact about Columbus, Ohio. So I learned that Columbus is the birthplace of the Oreo cookie. This was new information for me. In a little bit more serious uh, note, I'm, I'm very grateful for Dr. Alessandra uh, Geisha, who is our special guest today. And particularly, I'm grateful for her to support our journal club and help arrange the excellent panel and, and host this event. So I'd um, like to ask her to talk about her city, uh, her hospital, her, her unit. And uh, Ali, please, um, uh, you have the microphone. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting us all. We're very honored to be participating in this kind of uh, cross specialty of pediatric surgery and adult colorectal surgery to kind of help spread knowledge and kind of help close the gap between our two uh, disciplines because they certainly do overlap <clears throat> as our patients grow up and become adults. So uh, we work at Nationwide Children's Hospital. It's a freestanding pediatric hospital uh, with these beautiful fall colors um, here. We have a uh, quaternary referral colorectal center called uh, CCPR. It's the Center for Colorectal and Pelvic Reconstruction, where we have a multidisciplinary team with colorectal, gynecology, urology, GI, psychiatry, and social work all working together for uh, the congenital colorectal care of our pediatric patients. We deal mostly with Hirschsprung's disease and anorectal malformation um, and functional constipation within our CCPR center. Um, <clears throat> and we also are affiliated with the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Um, I myself uh, work at both hospitals as I'm a pediatric colorectal surgeon and uh, fellowship trained in pediatric colorectal surgery and then fellowship trained in adult colorectal surgery as well. So I have a bread and butter practice of adult colorectal surgery and then the pediatric practice and then transition patients with congenital colorectal, Hirschsprung's anorectal malformation and IBD into our adult uh, transitional care center at um, Ohio, the Ohio State. Just a little bit about Columbus. I think it's a, a great city that people oftentimes uh, don't know too much about, but uh, I think it's important to know that uh, we have the world's reigning um, MLS Cup champions, uh, multiple time winners, and here's their most recent win in 2023 of the MLS Cup. Um, going to their great games are great fun and lots of energy as um, uh, football or soccer fans may be aware of. Um, we also have the Ohio State uh, football team and uh, the band as well as you can hear with the script Ohio, as you can see here. Um, both the, so the sporting life is uh, uh, something that's always uh, kind of energizes the city on uh, those game days. Um, there's a great restaurant scene. They, there's a um, nationally famous um, zoo in Columbus as well. Um, and then lots of great parks, great outdoor activities as well. So if you have a chance and you haven't yet, please come visit Ohio. It's a great place to be. Um, and thank you for our, our panelists. We have Dr. Diefenbach joining us, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Christy Griffin, one of our colorectal surgery fellows, and Dr. Lise Pruitt as well, one of our uh, colorectal fellows as well. Um, so without, with, I guess without further ado, maybe we'll, we'll start on our discussions. 
Fantastic. Thank you. So our first article that we're going to discuss is titled Transition Care in Patients with Hirschsprung Disease, Those Left Behind. It's a paper that's brought to us from the UK. The first author is David Thompson and the presenter is Dr. Christy Griffin. So thank you very much and please start when you're ready. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So this this article is an interesting one. So um, this is published from the Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital, which is the largest colorectal center in the UK um, as far as um, uh, pediatric colorectal centers go. Um, so this is kind of a retrospective single center study uh, where they are looking at um, the transition process in their patients. Next slide. So just as a review, um, Hirschsprung's disease is a congenital disorder in which there's a portion of the colon that lacks ganglion cells, so patients have a resulting functional obstruction. It affects about one in every 5,000 live births. And despite doing a pull-through surgery um, in childhood, patients may still struggle with stooling and are at increased risk um, at lifetime for IBD. Um, 10 to 20 percent of adult patients with Hirschsprung's report poor poor outcomes with fecal incontinence, soiling, and poor psychosocial function. Um, there's also urologic and sexual function um, impairments that can um, arise kind of throughout adulthood. And then there's also some, there can be concerns for fertility in females. Next slide. Um, so just as a review again, this is um, kind of what happens in Hirschsprung's disease. There is a portion of the colon uh, most commonly um, in the rectum and sigmoid colon um, where the ganglion cells have not migrated. So then you, you have a dilated uh, colon proximal to this um, and um, uh, functional obstruction. And this can affect the entire colon um, also, which is called total colonic Hirschsprungs. Next slide. So the way that we uh, correct this in pediatric surgery is through a pull-through procedure. And just as a review, these are the three different types of pull-throughs that can be performed. Um, different centers do different, uh, have different methods, and each one kind of has their own pros and cons. Um, there's the DUML where you have a section, you leave a, um, a, a section of um, aganglionic um, rectum and then do a side-to-side -side anastomosis um, with the uh, ganglionated bowel um, that kind of forms this reservoir. There's the anti-suave pull-through um, in which you do a coloanal anastomosis and you leave a, a muscular cuff to avoid a pelvic um, dissection, but kind of over time that can um, cause an obstruction in itself. And then there's the Swenson pull-through, which we perform at Nationwide, um, which is when you do a coloanal anastomosis about a centimeter above the dentate line. Next slide. So there's no standardized pathway for transitioning patients to adult care in the UK. Um, the aim of this study was to analyze cross-sectional outcomes comparing adults who received transitional care for Hirschsprungs and those who did not. They analyzed the experience of patients who were transitioned. Um, they hypothesized that patients who had been offered transitional care might have worse functional and quality of life outcomes compared to those who did, uh, who were transitioned. And those without may have improved bowel symptoms and psychosocial functioning. Next slide. So this is a cross-sectional cohort study. They included patients with Hirschsprungs that were treated um, from at their center from 1977 to 2001 um, that were adults at the time of the study, which took place in 2018. They excluded patients who died, moved abroad, had a learning disability, or who were unable to be contacted. Patients were invited to take part in a questionnaire, um, which included uh, several validated surveys. They used the bowel functional score, or the BFS, the gastrointestinal quality of life index, and a short form 36, um, which looked at a lot of like psychosocial and mental outcomes. Next slide. Um, there was no standardized transition process prior to the year of 2001. They defined transitional care at their center as having at least one appointment uh, with a GI or colorectal surgeon immediately after being discharged from the pediatric practice that was coordinated by their pediatric surgeon. They broke patients down into categories, um, one being that patients where no transitional service was um, given, um, others, uh, then there's the patients who were referred to transition services, and then of those, there were patients that received just a single transition clinic appointment after discharge from uh, the peds uh, service. And then 
some that had more than one visit, but then were eventually discharged. And then the third group is ones that are still ongoing, um, undergoing ongoing adult care. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So they did a quantitative statistical analysis as well as a qualitative analysis and where they asked open-ended questions regard, really relating to the transitional care experience of the patients and their long-term follow-up. And this qualitative analysis was performed on a basis of a grounded theory of data collection and evaluation. Next slide. So there's a total of uh, 340 patients that were approached for the study um, with a 64% response rate. And after excluding those with a learning disability, they had 139 patients that were included in the study. Um, of those who uh, transitioned, there was only 10 who were receiving follow-up at the time of the survey. Um, and then just of note, um, the patients, this is, so the top part of this um, uh, table is their information at the time of their discharge from their the pediatric practice. 24 patients are still having soiling issues and three patients are still on rectal enemas. Um, and then at the time of survey, the median age was 29 years. Um, and at the time of survey as adults, there were still 14 patients that were having weekly or daily soiling issues. Next slide. They found, looking at functional outcomes, that the um, BFS score was higher in the patients that were not transitioned compared to the ones that were. Um, similarly, the GI quality of life scores were higher in the, one, in the patients that were not transitioned. Um, and they found no difference in physical or mental component scores in the SF36 survey. Next slide. They found there's uh, 24 patients that had soiling or social continence issues at the time of discharge from pediatrics uh, practice. 38% um, had a normal uh, BFS score, um, and then 21% had poor bowel function on that same scoring system. There were 17 patients that were um, not transitioned that continued to have soiling is issues at the time of discharge. Um, of those um, five, of those patients, uh, so 30% continued to have ongoing soiling at, at the time, years out when they were um, uh, surveyed for this study, and then 71% eventually had an improvement in their soiling. Uh, 14 patients had daily or weekly soiling at the time of the survey, um, and then 18 patients had reported severe psychological issues related to bowel function. Um, and then of note, there was about 55% of patients that reported no continence or bowel function issues at the time of their discharge from the pediatric um, clinic, which suggested that there was a de deterioration in these patients after discharge into adult care. Next slide. Um, looking at their qualitative data, there were uh, seven patients, or 35%, who reported an overall positive uh, experience with the transition process. Some themes that were um, that came out in in these open-ended questioning uh, questions that the patients answered. Um, one was planning. So um, overall, a uh, positive transition uh, or structured transition was uh, viewed positively by the patients. Um, unstructured was negative. Um, they commented that there was an inconsistent care. Um, and then also uh, slow speed of transition was associated with positive experiences. So patients did not want to feel rushed and they didn't want to feel like they were being kicked out by their pediatric providers. Next slide. Uh, the next theme they mentioned was patient and health services preparedness. Um, so good preparation was associated with active and consistent communication. Um, patients appreciated when their doctors were aware of their medical history and that um, one met with a consultant uh, to clarify that all their medical information was uh, correct and up to date in the transition process. And then poor preparation, um, patients commented when there was a lack of disease specific knowledge. So um, especially if there was, uh, they felt like their providers had fixed ideas of the treatment that they might need based on um, how they treat other conditions um, that are not Hirschsprung's disease. Next slide. Um, the next theme was um, adjusting into adulthood. Um, they, patients only reported negative or neutral experiences for this theme. Um, some of them uh, expressed kind of a mourning of a loss of a, having a trusted clinician. Um, 
they uh, felt like they could trust their pediatric surgeon because they know them so well um, and were obviously apprehensive about moving into adult care. Um, also, patients reported fatigue with healthcare management after transition. Some patients just kind of wanted to move on with their life and not have to worry about their Hirschsprungs. Next slide. So a few things, um, kind of takeaways from this. Um, Overall, their patients had improved functional outcomes as they moved into adulthood, which is kind of consistent with prior literature. Uh, but several patients reported new functional issues after discharge into adult care. Uh, patients who were transitioned had lower functional qual and quality of life scores. So this suggests that patients who are more symptomatic um, in adolescence are more likely to be um, push put into transitional care um, by their pediatric providers. And then some adolescents with social continence issues were not offered transitional care, but they might have benefited up from it. This in particular, the, um, the ones that were not transitioned, but did report some soiling issues at the time of um, discharge from the PEDS practice. Um, qualitative analysis of the transitional experiences revealed several themes. Um, in particular, patients were um, commenting on the planning process from both the providers and the patient side. Um, and they commented sometimes that there was a lack of experience with Hirschsprungs among adult GI and colorectal surgery specialists. And then there was a lot of comments on just um, adjusting to life outside of pediatric services. So the uh, kind of what to do with this information. So the timing of uh, the transition process is debated. In the UK, the, they, they say the transition process begins around the age of 14. Um, here at Nationwide, we do, um, we begin transitional surveys. Um, we begin giving them annually um, with a clinic vision beginning at age 12, not necessarily that we're going to transition them to the adult care starting at age 12, but it's to assess their readiness to transition and to kind of get the patient and the family in the mindset um, and um, that they are going to move into adult care eventually and then kind of um, supporting them with the tools that they need to get there. Suge some suggestions from this study, um, they report their recommendations are that patients that have a high symptom burden from Hirschsprungs, um, such as soiling, those that still have a stoma, the ha those that have an anti-grade continence enema, um, so a Malone appendicostomy or secostomy, or those who are still on rectal enemas should be referred to an adult provider with an interest in exposure in Hirschsprungs. Um, patients with moderate symptom burden uh, would benefit from at least a single follow-up with an adult care team. Um, and then they say that patients with mild symptom burden uh, can be referred to a general practitioner, which is not our practice here, but um, that was their recommendation. Um, and then they, um, some other things, so some problems with this approach, um, some, as we saw, some issues might arise in adulthood that patients may or may not be aware of and might, may or may not be anticipating. Um, one solution that they bring up is that the, in the UK, they have a uh, tracheoesophageal fistula support group that educates adult patients with a history of TEFs and bacterial abnormalities to uh, recognize new conditions um, and to anticipate those um, symptoms that might arise. Um, and things for them to be aware of and so that they can seek medical care appropriately into adulthood. Um, and then some limitations of this study. Um, so it was a retrospective review um, when they looked at everything, all the, the clinical status at the time of discharge. And then, of course, there's always recall bias in patient surveys. Um, in conclusion, um, so this is a small number of patients that were discharged. There, there were a small number of patients who were discharged with active soiling issues. Some improve and then some continue to deteriorate into adulthood. Um, <clears throat> bowel function could be a major um, burden affecting quality of life of patients well into adulthood. And this is something similar that we see in our patient populations um, in the research that we've done in our pediatric center. Um, and then the big um, kind of part of this article is that formal and more widespread transitional care is needed for congenital conditions such as Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, thank you very much, Christy, for this, um, for such a comprehensive summary. Um, would it be possible to get some comments from the panel in terms of pearls of wisdom or, or, or your takes on it uh, from a uh, clinical perspective? 
Yeah, I think from, I guess one of my, the first things that kind of stood out to me was how they defined transitional care and they just called it at least one appointment within GI or colorectal surgery after discharge from the pediatric team. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that's maybe a definition for research purposes, but I think from our standpoint, um, we get patients ready to transition to make sure they feel empowered and autonomous in their ability to care for themselves. And we help, as Dr. Griffin was saying, we help give them the tools to um, be knowledgeable about their condition. We give them the tools to be able to take care of themselves. So in my terms, and I think in our center's term, transitional care is a process, not just a one-time event saying that we gave them a referral. Because to me, this is the definition of a referral, not necessarily de the defini de definition of transitional care. I think we handle it very different. Um, so that was like my, my major um, exclamation point when I saw it. And I'm not sure if that was mainly just for research defining purposes or, you know, how they actually um, transition their patients. Thank you. Um, unless anyone else has any comments, I've got, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so my first question is related to the technical aspects of, uh, say, a suave uh, procedure. Now, from an adult perspective, it's it's almost intuitive that we would use a stapler for both an anastomosis and a transection. Um, now, I presume there's no stapler small enough to to go down a, a, a children's pelvis. Is that is that a fair assumption? And, and mechanically, how do you actually form an anastomosis? And what were the um, impacts of that um, as the patient grows? Yes, I can talk. Um, so for the types of pull throughs that we do for Hirschsprung's disease diagnosed in infancy um, or as a young child, you're, you're correct, but it's partly because we resect so low close to the dentate line. We're only about a centimeter above the dentate line. And so we do hand-sewn anastomoses for that. As far as staplers go, we do use staplers oftentimes for duhamels, um, like an endo-GIA can be inserted through the anus to uh, do these um, common wall anastomosis. Um, and for older patients or patients with total colonic Hirschsprungs, um, that is possible to do with a staple. So we'll staple off the pouch, mobilize the um, small bowel to come down uh, and do the side to side anastomosis with the pouch. You just have to be careful that you get a, the staple line um, all the way up to the end of the lower portion so that you don't have this um, spur that fills with stool and then becomes an obstructive uh, lesion. Um, as for older patients, we do use uh, stapled anastomosis, but the main issue is that because of the aganglionic segment starts at the bottom where the dentate line is, and obviously we want to be just above that so that we don't leave a, a large segment of dysmodal colon there, um, staples, staplers are not the best option for us. Thank you. And to follow up on that, say if you do an anastomosis a centimeter above the dentate line, does that then become, you know, four centimeters above the dentate line as the patient grows, or is it, is there, you know, as the, is there a difference, uh, you know, because of the, you know, uh, changing uh, body habitus? Al, you'll probably speak better t to that than I would just because you see them as the adult patients. Um, but at, in childhood, they seem to be pretty pretty standard as far as it doesn't seem to expand that much. But go ahead, Ali, as far as the older case. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, d I guess we don't have any studies that measure it at birth and compare it to, say, what it's like when they're 30 or 40. But I think when I see these adult patients with Hirschsprung's disease, oftentimes you can feel that scar. And I don't feel that they have this long cuff per se of residual aganglionic cells because it is pretty close to that dentate line. I think more often what we see uh, potentially in some patients is that the dentate line sometimes is compromised and they have injury to that dentate line. Um, and that also tells us that there's not like this expansive growth um, as they're growing um, that, you know, it, it doesn't change that much. Thank you. Um, uh, that, that's interesting. I guess my next question in relation to continence 
you know, when I compare it to an adult patient, at baseline, an adult would have perfect continence, which deteriorates over time. So they are aware of what perfect continence is. Uh, whereas in a child who has uh, been impaired by Hirschsprungs, they never reach that um, understanding. So um, what is expected bowel function post Hirschsprungs and, and how is it taught to a child? Because they've never really, you know, they've never seen anything else. Hirschsprungs patients actually do understand continence because the issue is that the sphincter doesn't relax. Unless the dentate line has been damaged, um, they do understand continence. It's more of an issue of getting them to learn how to relax their pelvic floor in order to evacuate. And that typically ha is, uh, occurs after potty training. And as they get closer to school age, it becomes an easier process for them. So it's not generally that they have incontinence unless they have either damage to the dentate line or they become so constipated that they have overflow incontinence. Um, but that's typically, it's typically a problem that they can't relax. So continence is something that they do most of the time understand. Patients with ongoing soiling may have either had damage to the sphincter muscles um, or the dentate line um, or have issues with constipation that has caused damage over time. Right. And, and so is that then the assumption of why, according to the study, deterioration is more prevalent after discharge from pediatrics? Because, you know, the, the, um, uh, the sort of is it the functional thing that the pediatric follow up does better than than adults when when the sort of the patients are left to their own devices and tense more? Uh, is that a fair thing to hypothesize? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard to know without knowing more detailed information about these patients on exactly what their issues are. But I think oftentimes in my patients, what I will see is that over time, that non-relaxing internal anal sphincter, and over time, they can have develop more difficulty emptying, whether that's due to, sometimes patients say they've had these maybe episodes of illness or diarrhea or viral gastrointestinal illness, and then afterwards, their um, ability to relax and uh, allow the stool to evacuate becomes much worse. And they have a lot of um, bacterial overgrowth. They get treated for SIBO. Um, we do sometimes do Botox to help relax that internal anal sphincter. And pelvic floor physical therapy, I think, is an adjunct that we're using more often in this patient population. Um, but I think it's hard to know exactly and it, it could be also that I think some, I mean, ultimately, patients with Hirschsprungs most of the time do require some kind of medication to help them with their motility issues. Even though that they have good ganglion cells, they oftentimes still have constipation issues. And so sometimes I think that's um, kind of downplayed or underplayed. And over time, their colon can stretch out if they're not evacuating, if it's not monitored, and they think they're okay. And over time, instead of going from maybe one or two stools every other day, then over time, gradually, it may become, you know, three to four stools, and they may have some overflow incontinence. And that when they're talking about fecal soiling, that would be my general um, supposition that they're talking about more of overflow incontinence due to general constipation because of that inability to fully evacuate or relax the internal anal sphincter in the setting of their dentate line, you know, assumingly that was previously intact and they don't have injury to the sphincter function. Now, potentially, there is some component of aging with that, that potentially when they're younger, if they have some component of injury to that sphincter muscle, then over time, sure, that of course can deteriorate. And it's hard to know, is this happening in a multiparous female who's had vaginal deliveries? Did that play a role potentially? You know, did they have an obstetric trauma that played a role as well? I think there are nuances that we may not be able to fully tease out from this study, but I'm sure it's potentially multifactorial for some patients. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, two more questions and then we'll move on. Um, at, <laughs> at least I'm very interested in sort of in this because there's no other opportunity to ask them. Um, the first question is, um, and, and Stephen, I think in the chat has commented about a similar issue. In the study, there were six patients with um, who had anti-grade enemas uh, and some of these were closed later. Um, and I guess my question is, 
when what is the indication for this kind of approach and are they closed because of change in body contour and leakage or do the patients get more mature and and, and manage evacuation better how, how do you how do you manage this yes i'll comment um so i had seen your comment i think that in hirschsprung's disease as opposed to anorectal malformation Antigrade um, flushes are not the typical because motility is is generally helped. There, we do have a patient population that gets them in, in severe cases, and especially if they have, for example, damage to the internal sphincter at the time of the pull through, um, and because of that, have uh, incontinence. So keeping them clean, socially clean, is going to be important. Um, but you're right in the sense I saw the comment in the in the chat. Um, they can change as they grow and if they gain weight um, or have any issues. The leakage at the time for appendicostomies, um, that can happen over time if the plication around the base of the appendix uh, breaks down. That can be related to a number of different things, whether it's the tube that's placed, how it's placed, um, and it can be related to um, body habitus change. Uh, as far as being obese in those patients, as you know, you can close it if they're no longer needing it or if you can transition to a medical program. Um, sometimes the the belly button, if it becomes really deep and it's difficult to intubate, um, you know, it may be beneficial to have a like a sacostomy tube, just convert over to a sacostomy if the antigrade flushes are um, beneficial but just difficult to manage because of back leakage through the appendicostomy. So I think there's a number of issues that um, could be related to any of these uh, specific uh, problems, but um, how you manage it is going to be individual patient related. So leakage at an appendicostomy is a single is one problem, and it can be multifactorial as far as what causes it. Um, what to do about it would be related to the patient factors as far as are they obese? Is it an issue with anatomy? Is it an issue with the plication around the the base of the appendix? Do we need the appendicostomy still or sh and should we convert it to a sacostomy? So those are kind of questions that you would need to, to answer before you determined what the right course of action would be. Thank you. Um, th that's very helpful. My last question, I guess, goes to the comment from the authors about adult surgeons or GI specialists with their special interests in these patients would be of great value. Um, uh, I think you've mentioned that in the presentation. So, so my question, I guess, what would be the take-home message that you would pass on to the adult colorectal community if um, you know if they see a patient who's previously had Hirschsprungs who's come in um, on their acute call? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is to assess what their motility is and if what their functional issues that they're having. Certainly. Uh, in the absence, as we've mentioned before, of operative notes and really knowing what their surgery and the patient maybe not knowing or maybe that information wasn't passed on to them. Um, sometimes getting a contrast enema can be helpful to determine what type of surgery they've had. Sometimes that'll tell you if, it, if they've had a do do him out pouch and then doing an anorectal exam under anesthesia or in an adult population, you might be able to examine them just the same if they tolerate it while they're awake. Um, and see if you can feel like a suave cuff and that would be kind of a tightness or kind of encasement around your finger that's causing an obstructive symptom versus a Swenson, you may feel like a gentle scar there or no scar at all. And sometimes knowing that anatomy or how to interpret um, what their anorectal exam is can help you defining your plan and just putting the pieces together and how to treat them. So I kind of first start with that and then seeing what their issues are, if their issues are incontinence, if their issues are inability to evacuate. And I think in the patients that I've seen most frequently um, who have been doing well and then they're not doing well, it's inability to effectively evacuate. And sometimes using um, pelvic floor physical therapy, short-term Botox injections, um, sometimes SIBO, having them evaluated for bacterial overgrowth can help. Sometimes flagell if there's inflammation of their Duhamel pouch. Certainly, um, I think there's a short mention here in the paper. There is 
some crossover with inflammatory bowel disease. We often, we see that more times uh, than not where patients may actually have inflammatory bowel disease. They may have undiagnosed. So doing a flexible sigmoidoscopy as well, or a full colonoscopy, depending if they're, you know, total colonic with the pouch or not, but identifying those issues and treating them. If it is IBD, treating them appropriately with medical management in conjunction with GI. Those are certainly all things to kind of keep in your toolkit in the back of your mind when you're examining these patients. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have certain grabs that we then share on social media, and this would be perfect as a nice summary for people to, to, um, uh, to take note of. Now, um, we're going to move on to the second article, um, and the uh, title of this is Challenges in Transition of Care for Patients with Anorectal Malformations, a Systematic Review and Recommendation for Comprehensive Care. Um, this is a multi-center American paper um, presented by Dr. Pruitt, uh, and of course, Dr. Geisha is actually one of the authors, so, so that's, a, um, uh, that's a bit of overlap there. Uh, please start when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the chance to present. Um, and go to the next slide. So for some background, anorectal malformations are one of the most common congenital intestinal anomalies between 1 in 4,000 and 1 in 5,000 newborns. Um, and unlike Hirschsprung disease, they are associated with other congenital anomalies um, that can be quite significant and relevant from a surgical standpoint. It's part of the um, Vactoral cluster of anomalies, which includes vertebral anomalies, anal rectal anomalies, cardiac anomalies, tracheoesophageal fistula, um, renal and other GU anomalies, as well as limb anomalies. And the type of anomalies, um, anomaly specifically in terms of the anal rectal malformation, influences the surgical approach as well as the prognosis in terms of long term um, continence and other complications. There are, is an increasing awareness of long term sequelae, including fecal incontinence urinary incontinence, constipation, as well as sexual dysfunction. And the more complex um, groups of malformations have worse long-term outcomes. Um, and the need to better understand these outcomes determines the needs and the structure that would be recommended for transitional care. Next slide, please. So this is um, one somewhat older classification, but it still shows in a lot of, especially like adult patients operative reports and in prior reports of high intermediate and low malformations. Um, malformations based on the location of a fistula that may exist between the GU um, and rectal system. So the higher malformations are those without a fistula, those with rectal um, atresia or rectoprostatic fistula. In females, those with um, no fistula, with rectal atresia or rectal vaginal fistula. And these are um, the more complex patients that have increased need for intra-abdominal procedures, often in infancy and going forward, and have worse long-term functional outcomes, more issues with soilings, bowel incontinence, may also have increased number of um, urinary tract anomalies and associated um, complications. Intermediate malformations, which um, should have a rectourethral fistula in the vulvar region in males or a rectovestibular fistula in females, has sort of an in indeterminate sort of their intermediate um, long-term outcomes as well as may be able to be approached um, simply from the perineum without going into the abdomen. And then the low malformations are those um, perineal fistulas, rectovestibular fistulas that are often can be managed with solely a transperineal approach, um, which has its own risks but fewer abdominal complications. I'm not really going to touch on some of the more complex um, malformations such as cholica as could do a whole journal club just on those alone. Um, next slide, please. So just to go over sort of the likely surgical operations that these children may have undergone, those with low malformations like a perineal fistula, many of them don't undergo any um, operations in the immediate period. Often these can be dilated at the perineum for allow for passage of stool and for the baby to grow until they can have their definitive surgery. Those with higher malformations or who don't have a fistula are often going to require a colostomy and a mucous fistula in the first few days of life. The most common um, way of doing that is with a divided colostomy. You often see oblique incision in the left lower quadrant um, with a divided stoma, although some um, providers do um, do a loop colostomy and you may see um, a smaller incision, but tend and occasionally are performed laparoscopically as well if the babies are not too distended. Next slide. I'm going to go over, this is one of those, there's many different types of malformations and the surgeries are different for each. Go over one example, 
um, of a malformation that can be um, approached from a perineal approach alone. So on the left, um, you can sort of see a transection of the anatomy with the muscle complex um, that is not connected to the rectum, which then has a fistula onto the urethra. Um, and so then this can be approached purely from the perineum using a stimulator to identify the location of the muscle complex. And then if you look in the middle um, approach, you do a midline incision on the perineum through the muscle complex and then dissect down until you identify the rectum and are able to dissect it circumferentially off the urethra. And that fistula can then be closed on the urethra and the rectum mobilized to the surface and then sutured in place within the muscle complex and then the incision closed both anterior and posterior to the anus um, with absorbable sutures. And for many, um, many times the abdomen does not need to be entered at all. And if they didn't have a stoma, um, they may not have any abdominal operations. Next slide. For higher fistulas, um, often this can be approached from a, um, a both a perineal and abdominal approach in, in the modern era, most often laparoscopically able to um, do the perineal approach in a similar fashion, but if the fistula is high up into the abdomen, can dissect, for example, the fistula off the back of the bladder, or the upper part of the urethra laparoscopically, which is shown here, and then the rectum can be divided and an endoloop or a stapler can be used um, to divide and secure the fistula, and then the rectum will be mobilized down um, below. And so some of these patients may have had a combination of operations. Next slide. So this was a systematic review, um, so performed with standardized search term in PubMed and the Cochrane Library, which initially identified 123 references, which were then screened down and identified included um, 22 articles in the systematic review. Um, and these overall scored using a Newcastle Ottawa scale for non-randomized studies. Um, however, due to the sort of lack of uniformity in the data collected and definitions, they were not combined for a meta-analysis. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a lack of standardization in the tracking of their long-term outcomes. And as we mentioned with the first article, a lack of uniformity in the definition of transitional care, the timing of transitional care. Um, and really some of the most important results were that they are several surveys of uh, multiple networks of patients that included the perspectives of families and really show the importance of multidisciplinary care teams, um, both with those that they had um, in the pediatric um, population that they is important to continue into adulthood, especially for many of these patients have complex GU history um, as well as rectal history. Um, and so sort of the importance of the, having that multidisciplinary team. Next slide. So really in conclusion and recommendations coming out of these studies that there's multiple um, essential stakeholders for both the pediatric and adult population. And that often we I think have done a good job in some of these larger centers of having the pediatric surgeon, gastroenterologist, urologist, neurosurgeon, as they may have tethered cord, as well as adolescent um, gynecology in one place. And that similarly, multidisciplinary teams um, for these complicated patients may need, need to be built in the adult setting as well to take care of them effectively, have gynecologic care and urology care um, that understand their anatomy, um, as well as adult colorectal or general surgeons. Um, as we mentioned previously, transition is more of a process and not a single event. And so recommendation was made in this paper to initiate discussions of transition um, early and start doing assessments of patient knowledge, their awareness of their own anatomy, um, what, what skills they have to take care of themselves and re be responsible for their own care and continue these annual assessments until a period is reached where it feels like they have appropriate um, knowledge and skills to transition and that that may be, you know, as many as six to nine years after that first assessment um, and then transition to a provider who's comfortable with their care. Thank you. Um, yeah, th thank you very much for that. Um, I guess um, a couple of questions, unless um, someone from the panel wants to uh, sort of uh, make any points before I start. Okay. Um, righto. So um, one of the things that I wanted to find out is kind of the sequelae that, that happened uh, in terms of ongoing care. Uh, do these patients need regular dilatations? Um, is there any... Uh, ongoing intervention that's required lifelong, um, or are they kind of 
sort of fixed for want of another word during their pediatric time and and when they become adults it's really only a new complication that we might be faced with yeah i mean i think um we have a lot of feedback from our adult interrectal malformation patients who um they tell us that they were told that they were fixed when they were kids and kind of discharged without any kind of follow-up and that left them with a lot of anxiety, depression, um, a lot of ongoing mental health issues because they were truly never fixed. These patients oftentimes have ongoing constipation, fecal incontinence, um, urinary dysfunction, ejaculatory sexual dysfunction along with their mental health issues. Um, so I think more so typically than the Hirschsprung's patient population, this patient is different in the sense that their issues are very much um, usually ongoing. Um, to, to your initial question of the dilations, um, we've also learned that from our adult patient population as well as from feedback from our families, um, that initially their um, patients routinely had dilation after their PSARP. Um, and that was routinely done and then eventually weaned off. And that was just part of the post-op follow-up. But we have had feedback about the medical trauma that this caused the patients and then also the parent-patient relationship and the trauma that it caused the parent to change their relationship of a, a nurturing caregiver to someone who's causing their their loved one discomfort and harm and that guilt that's associated with that, even though they were told to do this as a medical procedure, um, feeling like they had to kind of separate themselves as a caring, loving parent to someone who is doing procedures that had to be done no matter what, if the, the kid's kicking, screaming, crying, holding them down to get this done, especially as, you know, it's there's a difference between like a a two month old and certainly like a six month old or 11 month old, if you've ever tried to change a diaper, even, you know, a simple thing like changing a diaper gets very difficult. Um, and these patients sometimes don't always have the surgery right at birth. It may be, you know, delayed. And so um, from that, we have learned at our center, we actually did a study of dilation, no dilation and found that there are no significant outcomes difference. Um, and if the patient does have stricturing, we rather treat them with a Heineke Michelitz or a, another small same day surgery procedure where we open up the anoplasty. Because usually if it's stricture, it's skin level stricture that can easily be opened up um, with a small short surgery rather than having the patient go through the trauma. Because again, a lot of these adult patients, once they're able to verbalize um, the things that happened to them, tell us about how bad their trauma was. And oftentimes these patients are in counseling there on disability because of how significant this trauma was. They don't seek medical attention. They're afraid to go to doctors. They're afraid of the kind of medical abuses they see it that was done to them as children. And some of them have different relationships with their parents. They've had to go through family counseling to re kind of engage and get that loving relationship back. So um, I think having this, this tight relationship with our adult patients, giving us this feedback of how things were done 20 years ago allows us to move forward and push the field forward. So we, we really can give better care and better comprehensive care. Another factor of that is we have a psychologist in our clinic that helps the parents and helps the patients so that we can hopefully disrupt that um, chronic medical trauma that the patient undergoes, enabling them to have an overall better quality of life. Yeah, I think We've yeah, been sorry. very fortunate, obviously, that we have specialists that tra that cross the line between pediatric and adult care. Allie is one of them. Um, we also have pediatric um, uh, and adolescent gynecologists that take care in, of um, adult patients and adult providers within that specialty, especially for our female patients where fertility and everything is an issue and our urologic colleagues that cover the males is it's really critical to be able to address these ongoing issues specifically related to the anal rectal malformation you asked about ongoing or chronic issues are they just fixed or do they continue to have issues and and as lisa pointed out in the in the paper um, the severity of the initial anomaly determines in great deal whether they will continue to have significant ongoing issues or you know 
issues of inconvenience like constipation and management of bowel routines and things like that. But many of these patients, if they have poor sphincter complexes to begin with, have ongoing soilage, have to be bowel, have to have continued bowel management, may have prolapse, those kind of things, stricturing as as Allie mentioned. So continuing to be engaged with the medical specialist so that they can have these addressed and they're not kind of suffering in silence is really critical. And so the importance of our adult colleagues to help transition these patients and know that there's somewhere to go when they have issues, as the um, you know um, article mentioned that with bacterial patients, which is a subset of patients with anorectal malformations, that they have been told what to look for. What are the indicators of a problem that you should seek medical care for? And I think one of the things that we can do better as pediatric specialists is provide that information ongoing and then not only examine how much they understand about their own anomaly, what their own anatomy was, what their own history was, but also giving them the support information. We have this great, you know, connection of medical records now with the electronic medical chart. You can look up certain pieces of information, but operative reports are kind of hit and miss as far as whether you can have access to that. And there are certain hospital systems that they may end up in that don't participate in that sharing of information. And so one of the things that I think we can do better, and I, I, I know that for my own patients, for example, if they move out of state, their parents are being relocated for jobs or whatever, is I make sure they have copies of all of their operative reports, that they have information on their most recent imaging or critical imaging that either made the diagnosis or identified a complication or anything like that, and that they have an understanding of what they should be getting as far as as they get older. Do they need a GI specialist? Do they need a surgeon? Do they need, you know, GYN or urology? And who should they turn to for which problem? Because that's part of the overwhelming issues that these kids with complex anomalies have is they don't generally have one specialist that cares for all of the issues that they have. They really need a multidisciplinary team for the males, the urology team, the colorectal team, and then GI, depending on what their um, overall complication or overall uh, complexity is. And then likewise with the females, having the gynecologist, urologist, um, colorectal surgeon, and GI to help. And as Allie mentioned, um, I think we're doing better, but we can always continue to do better with the psychology of these anomalies. It's it's a trauma to the patients themselves, but it's also a huge trauma to the family because many of these were not recognized prenatally. And so it's a surprise at the time of birth. All of a sudden, your, your baby has to have surgery, or if they don't have to have surgery right away, like the perineal fistulas, even though that's one of the least as far as the complexity of the anomaly and one of the easiest um, with the best outcomes to fix, it still requires, as Allie mentioned, dilations, which, you know, if you've ever had a parent look at you and say, you want me to put what, where, um, you know, it obviously it sticks with them. And some parents kind of take it and go with it like, yep, this is just part of what I need to do to take care of my child. And some are traumatized by it and trying to address that and and acknowledge that we don't all know. Like I said, my training was everybody got dilated after surgery. And now we know that we don't actually have to do that. So. Thank you. I, I think the psychology bit of it, certainly for me, is incredibly eye-opening, uh, particularly being surgical. You kind of have an algorithm and you don't necessarily open yourself up to that but being a parent it, it would be incredibly intimidating um just to follow up on the perineal fistulas um are they what, what are the chances of a fistula being missed so do you see delayed presentations we do yeah karen go ahead and you can go ahead and uh, address this <laughs> I, th I think we, we've all had our like poster child patient that we remember for these. And um, I'll give you two examples. One was a five week old twin who presented with a mom who was absolutely just out of sorts because she has been struggling with this uncomfortable crying baby 
for five solid weeks in addition to taking care of another twin at the same time. And the reason for the referral was quote unquote, rectal prolapse. And when I saw the child in clinic, um, he, his, he had a perineal fistula that was a three Hager, which is three millimeters of an opening, um, as opposed to the normal 10 millimeter opening for a newborn um, of full term in infant. And this little guy was basically so obstipated from not being able to evacuate at five weeks, still was passing meconium. And he was just uncomfortable because he couldn't poop. And so I was looking at it and the prolapse that they were seeing was actually a pressure head buildup behind the sphincters that was causing the, the skin around the level of the complex to evert. And so when I dilated him, he put out like meconium was still what he had it built up. And it, once I got past like a five or six Hager dilator, um, was able to evacuate him to the point that now he just fell asleep, literally had been upset for five weeks. And finally the mom's like, oh my gosh, I feel like a horrible mom. I'm like, how are you possibly a, a bad mom? Your doctors didn't recognize this as what it was. And so um, that was one presentation. The other is a 13 year old young lady who has been told she's been constipated and not following instructions and not uh, compliant with care and has been on multiple bowel regimens as, you know, um, and, and quote unquote difficult patient who was referred to our center for evaluation of funct functional constipation with soiling. And as part of our routine workup, we do an exam under anesthesia. This is a, a teenager, you know, um, and when we did the exam, I'm like, this doesn't look right. And sure enough, we do a stimulation and she has a perineal fistula that has been missed for 13 years. And her soiling is not soiling from overflow incontinence from constipation, but because the opening is not within the sphincter complex. And so her mom literally cried, like when we told her that this is not constipation and she's been doing the best she can. She just has an anatomic problem that we need to fix. And so it, it can be a relief on one hand to know what the problem is, but also very disheartening that it can be missed for, for a long period of time. And to answer your, your question more specifically, um, Dr. Griffin is actually working on that as a publication um, so she can answer some of those questions. Yeah, there's actually, um, there's a lot of literature um, published out there for delayed diagnosis of anorectal malformations. And we did a project here um, specifically looking at if there is any um, component of social determinants of health that could be influencing it. And it's interesting, we had, um, we looked at just low anorectal malformations, so the perineal fistulas and the rectal vestibulars, which are the ones that are most commonly missed. Um, and we had about 30% of patients had a, di a delayed diagnosis, which was um, beyond the first 48 hours of life. So 30% are, those are being missed on their newborn exam, which is really where the diagnosis should be made. Um, so, um, and in that project, it's hopefully coming to a journal near you shortly, but um, it will be, um, it's, we found that there's patients that have a lower um, child opportunity index, which is um, kind of a composite score for social determinants of health based on where they live and the communities they come from, um, that the ones that had lower uh, opportunity index actually had a higher incidence of delay in diagnosis. Mm. Uh, thank you. I think Dr. Glandiak has a... Uh, no. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight there's a wonderful editorial written by Mary Fallett, who's a past president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association that accompanies this article, which is very worthwhile reading. Thank you. Um, just one last question, um, and I guess it's extrapolation on the fistula um, comment or, or the delayed presentation. One of the other articles we sort of featured this month was long-term outcomes of perianal fistulas in pediatric Crohn's disease. Um, I'm not going to focus on Crohn's, but my, my, I guess my question is if we see a child or adolescent, say, you know, eight to 12 year old, um, what are the assumptions of the etiology of the fistula? Do, can they get cryptoglandular fistulas? Do you see that? Or is it 
uh, more likely to be some sort of congenital missed pathology or IBD? I mean, I think um, sometimes a, a fistula is just a cripital glandular abscess, probably in most common, common patients, specifically with anorectal malformation patients. They don't have the dentate line. They don't have those cryptoglandular areas. They don't have the anal canal. So they don't have that same pathophysiology for the common other reasons why normal anatomy patients might get the cryptoglandular abscesses associated with the fistulas. Um, and so if a anorectal malformation patient has a fistula, most oftentimes we would think of um, an anastomotic leak or an anastomotic um, inflammation or something from a, a post-surgical problem or issue. Um, and certainly, you know, commonly if you have a abnormal or multiple tract um, fistulizing disease, then, you know, certainly then I would think about IBD or if there are other ongoing symptomatologies like um, cramping, belly pain, weight loss, you know, other things we would think about in the adult population as well. I would just add to that that if you're worried about a misdiagnosis, then what you're looking at is you're looking for the normal pucker around the opening. And a lot of times visually, it doesn't look right. And it's also an opening in the midline between where the sphincter complex should be and either the vagina or the posterior aspect of the scrotum. So if it's off midline or posterior to the opening that you're looking at it, then it's not a missed congenital anomaly. And whether or not there's inflammation would be, you know, because most of these babies with, you know, crypto um, granular uh, fistulas are, are very young and they typically grow out of it. So if it's an older patient outside of the infancy range, so um, I would say look for other potential etiologies, but a missed congenital anomaly will be in the midline, anterior to the sphincter complex, posterior to the vagina, um, or the scrotum. Thank you very much. That that's very helpful. Now I'm sorry that I've, we're running over time, but these um, answers have been incredibly stimulating and helpful. Um, so I, I hope that um, uh, the viewers, when when the uh, when the recording's available, is going to benefit uh, from this. Um, now we're going to move on to the special guest component, and so. Um, uh, Ali Gazer, uh, Dr. Ali Gazer is the uh, special guest. Um, now, um, as far as I am aware, um, she is the only colorectal surgeon who is formally trained in both pediatric and adult colorectal surgery in the world, which is um, no small feat. Um, she is the associate professor um, in the um, OSU College of Medicine and the Medical Director of the Colorectal Transitional Care at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, uh, so um, she has a unique presence in both of these institutions and obviously uh, has a, a unique perspective in relation to transition of care. Um, and so I was hoping to ask a few questions of you um, uh, before we uh, finish uh, our session today. So thank you. Um, the, the first question, um, I guess in, in the field full of highly successful clinicians, most with type A personalities, having a dual fellowship is obviously, as I mentioned, unique. Um, how did you um, decide to pursue such a niche area and what would you uh, suggest um, to trainees that might want to follow in a similar pathway? Yeah, I think certainly for me, it was kind of the serendipitous pathway. Um, I was a, a pediatric critical care fellow at um, Children's Mercy in Kansas City, and we would have pretty complex patients with cloaca come into our NICU, and they would all go to Ohio um, to seek a quaternary, quaternary referral center. And I wanted a little bit more... Um, education and um, experience with this patient population because out of pediatric surgery, that was the patient population that interest, interested me the most. And so after I completed my general surgery residency, I came to Columbus, Ohio to do a pediatric minimally invasive surgery fellowship along with a pediatric colorectal uh, fellowship. And it was through those fellowships at our CCPR center where we would have adult um, anorectal malformation patients come to our clinic. 
And they would all have the same story. They'd be in their 30s, their 40s, and they would just come to us just bawling with tears saying, thank you for seeing me. No one understands me. I've been to all these big name adult colorectal centers and no one understood what anal rectal malformation is. The only thing anyone ever wanted to give me was an ostomy. I've had so many surgeries. I want to see if there are other options People would tell me that they would never touch, other patients would be told they would never touch them with a 10 foot pole because of the amount of surgeries and complexities that they've had. And that led to a lot of shame for these patients. And a lot of these patients really kind of suffered in silence, as was mentioned before. And they finally step out into the world, so to speak, and try to have find someone to help them and no one understands them. And they, through the internet and such, came to find nationwide. And at the time we were, you know, would see adult patients. And it just, at that time, kind of became clear to me that it, it was 2017 or so, that we don't have a plan for these patients, that they're just being told, you know, go out into the world, you're fine, and no one's helping them. And even at these well-known centers, we couldn't offer them the same multidisciplinary care and balanced care that they were getting at a pediatric colorectal facility. So it was through that that I decided to then do an adult colorectal fellowship to then be a surgical home for these patients and be able to them be able to offer them different things besides just a stoma, be able to help coordinate multidisciplinary care. And through that transition, I did the adult colorectal fellowship at Ohio State, which happens to be you know, down the road, and was able to facilitate a relationship between the two institutions where we now have a multidisciplinary team at Ohio State along with Nationwide. And we work to transition patients into our transitional clinic. Um, what I would suggest to trainees going on to this, and I guess I would maybe amend your initial say, statement there. I think there are more people who have followed in my footsteps um, after me. However, not enough. We certainly need more, more people um, to do transition of care because it's hard for patients to, tra to uh, travel to Columbus. Um, but I, what I would say to trainees, I think, is you have to think outside the box. You have to be willing to forge new relationships. Um, and you have to be willing to have an institution that values the care that you're going to be giving to these patients. Because now on the adult side at Ohio State, I have patients coming to me from all over the country. I've had some international patients, and they still come to me saying that tears in their eyes, that they've been at a loss. They have their life back. They finally found someone who understands them. Patients who have come off disability are in the workforce again because we've been able to offer them freedom from being at home with their fecal incontinence by offering them transanal irrigations or being able to help them with their Malone or their psychostomy and things that they've had or be able to give them an APR if that's what they need because of their multiple prolapse issues, but really be able to understand them as a full patient. Um, and I think you really have to have an institution that values that, an institution that's willing to support you, um, because sometimes these are not high, are, are high RVU generating visits. These are visits that will take you 90 minutes, two hours, three hours to really talk to these patients, to be able to gain their trust, to find out all the things, because some of them have been 60 years. I had a patient who said they hadn't really talked to someone in 60 years about their problem, and I had years and years with worth of voluminous trauma and all these things to work through with them. But I think you have to have just a, an institution that's willing to support you. You have to be flexible and you have to have good relationships with your pediatric surgery cohorts it, at, in that area because you need to lean on them for information and then they're going to need to lean on you just the same. So it really is about building relationships from a you know kind of multifactorial standpoint. Thank you. I guess um, most of us as adult colorectal surgeons get approached to, you know, uh, treat or assist in the treatment of an adolescent or a child. What are some anatomical or physiological milestones that you would define where uh, you would think an adult trained surgeon is um, uh, would be equipped to deal with a child? Uh, for instance, I have an arbitrary 35 kilogram cutoff that if someone's smaller than that, I prefer not to get involved. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think it may not be as clear cut as a certain weight limit or a certain age cutoff because 
you know, at least in the United States, um, you know, there may be patients who are on the 10, nine years old who have that weight cut off, but a pediatric hospital may still be the best place for them. There may be patients who are older, but a pediatric hospital, depending what the disease condition, may not be the best place for them. If they have colorectal cancer in their 17, maybe having them in an adult institution is a better opportunity for them because the adult institution is used to dealing with rectal cancer far more commonly than a pediatric hospital. So I think it is multifactorial. I think you need to think about the patient as a whole and what system is gonna support them best to get them to the best care that they need. Um, at our institution, it's it's not by weight. It's at OSU. It's fifteen, kind of just because of um, the different anesthesia requirements. But we can go lower by special request or have younger patients. We have had patients transfer because of specific IBD concerns from Nationwide, who 14 years when I was a fellow that needed specific care that Nationwide couldn't provide. Um, so I guess in my mind, I think of it, um, you know, maybe more nuanced than just a weight, because I think, um, I, I think there there definitely are there's a gray area between what what place can give the best care if you have choices. Now certainly if you're at a community hospital, I think those general surgeons are probably used to dealing and used to operating on younger age groups and their their definition of young might be 10 or nine or certainly you know something even lower because at community hospitals they may just have fewer resources. Thank you. Um, the next question is more of a technical question about, say, management of ostomies in children, um, uh, which is something that I, I don't have a good feel for. Um, from a technical perspective, um, do ostomies um, get matured in the same way, meaning is there a greater propensity to prolapse or do they? does the spout evolve as the child grows? Um, do you have to revise them when they become adults uh, or, or when they become adolescents? Yeah, I mean, I think prolapse is a ongoing concern in the pediatric patient kind of as, as it may be and kind of difficult to manage at times. Um, it's matured in the same fashion. I do think we're more likely to put at least kind of it at our practice at Nationwide, we're more likely to put fascial sutures to try and prevent prolapse. Um, and depending on why the patient has the ostomy, that may change us sometimes to take it down sooner if it's going to be temporary. Or there are patients when they've had multiple prolapses that we do try different approaches just to try something new. But there are patients that have, just like in the adult world, multiple prolapses that are hard to manage. Certainly if it's a loop, we try and change it to an end and such uh, similarly that we do in the adult world. Um, the spout doesn't really change much over time or the stoma itself. It kind of grows with the patient. I've, I myself have not seen patients that have become stenosed or um, I guess, you know, some patients may become retracted potentially depending on the, the um, how quickly they may put on weight or how they grow. But I think generally speaking, most patients who have the stoma, it kind of grows with them and they don't necessarily have, um, you know, issues with it over time per se. There is, I would say, an equal, um, equal risk of hernia formation. Um, Pediatric patients can develop hernias as well. However, we're more likely to do a primary repair. Um, certainly, we don't use mesh in the pediatric world. Um, but I think the same risk factors are, you know, with increased abdominal pressure, certainly our patients aren't smoking, they're not diabetic, and they're not lifting heavy weights. So that's helpful from that perspective. Um, but I think the tissues, it depends on how, um, how large your uh, fenestration is that you make. Um, there is a, you know, the larger the fenestration, the higher the risk of peristomal hernia. Some of our patients may have connective tissue disorders as well, similarly to the adult population, and that may play a role. Um, but generally speaking, as the patients may become adolescents and the more weight that they gain, potentially they have a higher risk. And I think that's, you know, what we see most commonly is um, with weight gain, potentially a higher risk for hernia formation. Thank you. I guess... Because they're young, they might not be smoking, but they may be vaping. 
Um, now, one one question about last question about stomas, and again, I'm sorry about the um, the length of time. From a social perspective, and also a a, a feasibility perspective, how are stomas man managed by the child and a family? Um, and um, are there any sort of um, manifestations of that when they uh, when they grow and become adolescents and, and may need to see an adult uh, surgeon? Yeah, I mean, I, I generally speaking, um, the the parents are taught how to manage the stoma, and the parents usually manage it. At, at what point the child starts taking over? I think that's individualized. Um, I think there are some patients who are just more mature than others and may. Um, be more uh, independent in their own care earlier on. We do have a fair amount of patients that have developmental disabilities as well, and certainly they will never become autonomous in their own care, and they will always need some kind of caregiver, and some of those patients do have home health nurses that help the parents as well. Um, but it, for patients who are um, um, not developmentally uh, impaired that oftentimes they will at some point, usually around between 10 and 12, um, be the one who's emptying and changing their bag and such. Um, and then how that alters really with when they are taken care of by an adult colorectal surgeon, you know, I think it's important to know what else their anatomy looks like. Um, and I know this maybe wasn't part of your question, but sometimes these patients will still have the colon in place. And if they've had, um, there can be hard to prep if you're going to do a colonoscopy, frankly speaking, if they've had this um, mucoid concretions in their colon for years and years and years, and now all of a sudden they're 45 and you've got to do a colon cancer screening. To me, I do think when I see some of these patients and I see some of the things that we do, that um, screening for these patients may be very, very difficult. And we do, I do try and bring that to the pediatric surgery discussions of what are long-term plans. And potentially that would be something where the, the adult colorectal surgeon may say, okay, why do we have the stoma? Are we ever going to reverse it? You know, or is it a functional problem? Um, is it a permanent stoma? What is remaining? Do they have a long Hartman's? And, you know, all those things, you know, and going on how, how you screen for cancer going forward. Uh, thank you. And my, my final question, and this is related to the transition of patients. We know that young uh, patients with an extensive history of um, medical intervention may be either far more mature than, than their chronological age or arguably less mature than their chronological age. And there's a particular relationship between their parents. Um, and uh, given that the patient may be viewed by the parent as the same, having the same condition, as they transition from pediatric to adult and therefore become autonomous in their decision making, what is that relationship with the uh, physician and the parent like? How do you um, empower the, the, the patient um, and, and explain to the parent that they, they may need to step back at some point? Yeah, I think it's certainly, especially with our patients and our parent population, that they've gone through such hard times and such um, difficult times from a medical standpoint. They do carry that trauma with them and they're afraid to let go. They're afraid to let their child take over. They're also very afraid to go to an adult center. And I think that's very natural, normal process. But that is why we start at the age of 12. Um, the age of 12 is recommended from gottransition.org. It's used across the board for all, um, for congenital heart, for transplant, for all medical specialties. But I think that's why starting at the age of 12, and we have a readiness to, tr to transition survey that's given to the patient, but it's also given to the parent or the caregiver so that they can help and em help empower them. And I think the more that we they see that we're helping their child slowly gain knowledge and power, and that autonomy that they're more likely than to let go and take a step back. And I think it's really important that during those visits, the family member or the caregiver starts to say less and the child starts to say more. Um, and that can really help also, I think, give the parent confidence that the patient's going to be okay. And it is a, it's a process. And if you start this at age 12, that by the time they get to 21, 22, the family is going to feel so much better. They're going to feel so much more comfortable about it. And they're also 
going to be thankful, generally speaking. And, and what we do is on that transition readiness survey, survey, we identify one or two things for them to work on in the next year so they can build upon that experience. So um, do you know why you take your medications? Can you explain your surgical history? I do tell my patients that one day they may be the smartest person in the room when they go to an emergency room and they're going to have to explain to someone what a Malone is and they're meeting an emergency room physician who doesn't know what a Malone is. It doesn't know what a rectobulbar fistula is and they have to be the one to explain that. So I start with that process and build on that. So by the time that they're um, you know, in their 20s or you know, there's not really an age cutoff, it's just when they're ready, that they really do feel empowered to stand up for themselves. And I think doing it in that kind of slow but very uh, meticulous process that's well-defined, the family feels more comfortable. And we do this with psychiatry, we do this with social work, so we do have this great support system helping us get that patient to where they need to be. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I think you guys do an amazing job and uh, I do hope that it, it, with time it would be far more formalized and integrated into sort of holistic surgical care. Um, I certainly learned a lot um, and um, I, I'm very grateful for, for um, your involvement and support in the Journal Club. Um, our next month will be in uh, the uh, University of Minnesota, so the last Monday of October. Um, and again, uh, thank you all and um, have a lovely evening. Thanks for having us.